Hello everyone, Perry Nemiroff here, and I'm back with another Collider interview. This one for Collider Nightmares, because today we have Greg McLean in the studio, who is the creator of the Wolf Creek franchise now. Yes. I still can't believe that, I was just telling you before that I interviewed John for Wolf Creek too. If you asked me back then, would there ever be a Wolf Creek series? <laughs> oh, I never would have thought that. If you asked John and myself, we'd say the same thing. Uh, I know, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we, we had actually been talking about it for quite a while, the concept, and we actually released two prequel novels as well, the, the pre-story of Mick Taylor, and some of those stories kind of found their way into the TV series because we needed to find, you know, what was the angle of the story we could mine to make a whole series out of it, and, um, you know, we managed to come up with a really cool concept. Did you write the books too? I did, no, actually I co-wrote both novels, so I, there's two amazing horror authors in Australia called Aaron Stearns and Britt McBean, so I, I had... I sort of pitched them the storylines and wrote the treatment for it and then we developed it because they're much better writers than I am in the novel form. Hmm. Um, and they're great write, great horror writers. So um, we did those together and then the series was written by two other uh, writers who were part of the TV production team. And you have three different mediums there. So are there different rules to make the Mick Taylor story good for a movie versus a TV show versus a book? Um, I think, you know, I, I, I do feel like each each story iteration is a different kind of genre in itself. The first film is just like a, it's a balls out horror film. And it's the kind of thing you can only ever do once because you can't keep that that level of insanity and horror up for, for too long. The second one is more of an action uh, suspense mm -hmm. movie with some comedy thrown in. The series is definitely much more of a thriller, um, a thriller suspense story because it's you know it's obviously it's about a young American woman whose family get murdered by Mick in the first episode, and she goes on a quest of revenge to bring Mick Taylor to justice. So it's a different kind of genre of story, and suits a better it's it's better for a longer form piece of storytelling. When the novels are, the novels are much more uh, languid, and they're actually more horrific than any of the movies because you can really you can go and the stuff in the books is like oh my god I can't even read some of the stuff, but um. It's nuts. You can do a lot because you're imagining it as well. I'm wondering now. I know there's ratings for films and for right. TV as well. So with a book, is there anyone saying you can't even create this visual in text? Um, well, we we had a little bit of edit. You know, Penguin Publishing, which is a pretty big publisher, you know, worldwide. They were our publisher, and I'm amazed that they didn't make us stop. I was, you know, thinking we're going to get in trouble, but we didn't. Um, I think I think with books you can go further because it's it's a very selective you know you'll read at your own pace you can close the page you can jump on like like a, if a movie it's kind of and you're watching it it's happening in front of you um, so books you can get away with a lot I, feel I like would love to listen to an audiobook narrated by John <laughs> that's a really good idea I might ask him to uh, to John Jarrett reads the, oh yeah the, the, the books That'd I'd be, be all over that. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll call him and see if we can get it out. You were supposed to buzz, man. Sorry. This, when I, oh, wrong this, one. <laughs> this, sorry. Okay, this one is for a great idea. Yes, yes. And this one is for a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, on. I have Hang no on. more Good ideas. Good idea, bad idea. Okay, cool. Um, can you tell me about your decision to only direct one episode? <laughs> oh, wrong buzzer. Um, this one. This one's also for spoilers. Okay. Uh, the I was doing uh, I was directing a movie called The Balcor Experiment and uh, we'll I've heard a little bit about it's that in the past that, few days. Yeah, we finished this film and it was just at Toronto on the weekend, um, and I was posting that and we'll, we'll, the post was uh, elongating and Wolf Creek was starting and and I basically was going to direct the whole thing, and then I realised that I couldn't I had to leave a bit later so I just said look I'll just do the big finale episode and I'll set it up with Tony Tills the other director, and. Um, and he's a you know, very, very, you know. I'm a big Ash versus Evil Dead fan. So when right. I saw his name attached yes. to this, I'm like, oh, yeah. I know I'm going to get a certain something right. that I'm going to be very happy with. As soon as I, as soon as they're like, oh, he's working on Ash versus Evil Dead, I'm like, how quickly can I start? Because I'm obsessed with Evil Dead and uh, I love that series. And It's so, a beautiful, beautiful yeah. series. And you could see the same quality in the yeah. cinematography here. Right. Yes. He did an amazing job. I was very happy with with his work on it, he's great. That's awesome. And what about the writing? Is it, I mean, you were just saying that someone else co-wrote the book. Yes. So is it hard for you having created this character to pass Mick Taylor over to someone else? Are you ever like, oh, I don't know if this person's gonna get him like I do? Um, I mean, so, I mean, I think anyone who creates anything has that kind of tinge of like, uh, is it gonna work? Is it gonna be as good as I want it to be? Um, those kind of, any fears were quickly kind of, you know, va vanquished by working with these people and with Tony, with the producers, with the two writers who work with uh, Peter Gawler and Felicity Packard, they were very, uh, they hadn't really worked in the horror genre before. They'd done a lot of crime shows and they'd done a very massive mm -hmm. crime show in Australia. So they approached it with kind of a fair degree of respect, which is 
interesting considering it's like a horror franchise, but they really were focused on character and the emotion and all the things that I'm that I think is important in keeping it, you know, keeping it genuinely good entertainment. Which is absolutely vital here with yeah. a, with a six episode series. Right. You are very lucky that John doesn't age. <laughs> Now, I isn't feel like that you weird? can keep milking the series for all it's worth. <laughs> is that the weirdest thing in the world? Like, I mean, this is a question I have. Why is John now? The first movie was two thousand and five. He looks younger now than he did then. I mean, I would have Some thought sort of that this that series they... took place the day after the first movie. I never would have known. I, uh, there was many mutterings on set asking the same question: "What the hell is with that?" I mean. He looks. I mean, what, there must be a painting somewhere that's just this hideously deformed kind of dissolving picture of John, because uh, he's made some deal with the devil, I'm sure. <laughs> How has your working relationship changed with him over the years as an actor's director? Do you guys have a shorthand? Is there any specific thing he likes to get from you before he shoots a scene? Um, we, we we do have a great shorthand, and we we kind of tend to improvise a lot on set. Um, we can't. What we what we have become is very good sounding birds, uh, boards for things that are too too far or too silly mm. because we tend to do a lot of, you know, oh, how about this, how about that, how about that. So we develop the character a lot while we're together, and that's kind of one of that you can only get that from doing multiple kind of things with someone. Can I get an example of something that's going too far, either in the humor respect or the carnage, because it it's extreme in both the, ways. The um the the humor things I probably couldn't say on air okay. anywhere in the world. Uh, they're safely <laughs> locked in the confines of the outback. Some of the room, because the, the, what happens is when when John gets into character as Mick, it unlocks a very very strange part of his brain. He just becomes this vile, hideous, you know. And he kind of and, he, and when he finishes playing the role, he's like just and he realizes um, he realizes that kind of a part of Mick kind of takes over. An example that's not so crass that I can say in air. He he said that one day when he was um, he was shooting uh, and we were living in this you know town in Australia working on the show. And it was a weekend. He was just kind of you know walking on the street and he um, and an attractive woman was walking towards him and he kind of gave her this big kind of grin and this sort of sleazy look and said "G'day, darling." And then he walked past and stopped himself like, "Oh my God, what am I? <laughs> what kind of sleazeball?" And he realized that kind of a bit of Mick was in there because Mick's just this you know disgusting pig of a human being and. Um, you know, he kind of let it spill over into his mind a little bit, which is what great actors do, you know. Can he turn it off, though, on set? Or even in between takes when he's interacting with the other actors, is he kind of keeping in that same Mick Taylor brain? In, he, in the movies, he kind of tends to be more, um, you know, he sort of has to go into it. I mean, for the first movie, he basically was in it for the entire shoot. For, for six weeks, he was just, he wouldn't, you know, didn't interact with the cast, would kind of intimidate them a little bit just to keep separate so that when it came to the nasty stuff, he didn't feel anything. Um as it goes, you know, now that he knows the character, knows the psychology, it's easier for him to kind of just jump in. And TV series is pretty broken up in terms of, you know, six episodes, massive shoot, you know, jumping all over the place in terms of time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so now he kind of wears it like an old kind of hat, basically. Slightly disturbing, but yeah. good for the show. I know, I know. It's, it's kind of weird. Can you talk a little bit about Lucy now? Was Eve always the protagonist of this show idea from the start, or did you ever toy with having other main characters in there? Um, not really, no. I mean, basically, when we had the big story meeting about what the show was going to be, uh, I arrived and I knew a couple of things. I knew that it was going to be uh, a female hero and she's going to try and track down Mick. And that was kind of, that was the very bare bones. And from that, we extrapolated the storyline and, and all the other characters and all of the all of the kind of thematic things we wanted to play with. But it really, it, and I think one of the things was basically, the challenge for me was thinking, no one wants to see, including me, just a, like a repeated version of Mick killing people. It's really, it's quite boring. But what is interesting is basically finding a way to go into this world, which is the outback, and uncover all different aspects of that, all different characters, and kind of be in the world of Wolf, Wolf Creek as Mick kind of is the overarching kind of villain. Villain, um, but being able to explore this whole world and atmosphere, which I thought was really a fun way to approach it. He's a pretty damn creative killer, though. I feel like <laughs> you could just watch one after the other. I mean, right. again, I don't want to spoil anything here, but like, wow, the, fir the first Sorry, episode, that's my though. Hang on, which is, this is my spoiler. You're, you're, on, right you're on your game right okay. now. The first episode, though. Right. I mean, I... <laughs> It's, it's weird because I know the films, I know what he's capable of, but that, the moment, hit me out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh, right. wow, Like this show is taking it to a level that I didn't expect. Right. How would you sell this show to somebody who doesn't know the films? And yeah. I mean, I don't even know if I would say this is for all horror lovers in general, because right. it is especially intense. So what right. would you say to people who are maybe considering jumping in? Um, I, I mean, the first thing is I don't think you have to have seen the movies. I think it's uh, it's a standalone, uh, you know, good piece of storytelling. I think it's uh, 
Uh, and and, I, and I, I would argue, I, I don't, maybe my tastes are slightly hardened because of my years of exposure to intense horror, horror films. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's that intense. I feel like it, starts, it definitely starts with a bang to get people's attention. And then you have a lot of time to basically then catch up and mm-hmm. kind of develop the characters and stuff. I mean, I would say that anyone interested in true crime, in, um, in you know, the serial killer genre, in horror, in suspense in um, detective stories. I mean, a lot of this story is really a detective story. It's about a character who uh, unpacks, tries to unpack and understand a villain so then they can take them on and kill them. So it's a, it's a kind of interesting thing. And that's kind of the suspense element because the question in the series is, is this young woman from another, another place going to be able to come into this foreign, dangerous environment that's very, very masculine and very dangerous mm-hmm. and deal with that and survive it? Not, not, not just Mick as the, as the predator, all the other predators in this landscape as well. So it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's a little bit like a Western as well because, you know, it's like uh, traditionally the male plays that role. Usually, you know, the bad guys come and kill the ranchers and the husband goes on a quest for revenge. In this story, it's a young woman in a foreign country, Australia, from the States, who then is in the same situation, but she becomes this empowered, um, you know, female heroine who goes after one of the baddest guys around. So it's, you know, dramatically very compelling as a, as a concept. You should finish that with a good buzzer. That was a great pitch right there. There you go. <laughs> Before we have to wrap up, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Belco Experiment because we here at Collider, at Collider Nightmares in particular, are very excited about it. We were talking a bit about it on the show recently. Can you tell me about your experience bringing it to TIFF? What happens when you bring a movie like that to TIFF? It's got a killer first screening. Do you then get just like swamped with distribution offers? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we um, basically, um, you know, we, we just really literally finished the film. So we're kind of racing to kind of get it ready to, for, um, ready for TIFF. Um, getting into that festival is a huge deal for, the, for any movie. And, and getting selected for Midnight Madness where it screened was amazing. Um, because you have a room of dedicated, you know, mm-hmm. a thousand dedicated horror films are there to be freaked out. Um, so it's a perfect platform for the film. Uh, so we had, you know, we had a Saturday night screening, which was last Saturday night, which was just went crazy. People were just like losing their minds in the theater, and then pretty much straight away we had, you know, people rushing in to try and distribute the movie. And so by my, by the next. And by the next day, we had a deal to distribute. So it's coming out on March 17th mm-hmm. through Blumhouse Tilt and Orion. Uh, Blumhouse Tilt is Jason Blum's distribution company. Um, and uh, they love the film and, you know, they couldn't be in better hands in terms of people understand that genre. Why Tilt and why not Blumhouse Standard? Is there a specific reason? Because I know Tilt is more for exploring new methods of distribution. So was there any reason you went that route and not the traditional theatrical release? I think they, I, they, I think they have two paths. One is the universal path and one is their Blumhouse Tilt. And I think that's more targeted for films that don't quite fit the kind of uh, sort of more obvious kind of horror mm-hmm. genre. And this film is a very unique movie. This is a... This is a very crazy film. It so it's kind that of way. it's 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 more suited to a very focused kind of uh, marketing approach, which is what they sort of you know what they do very well. Cool. And I also wanted to ask you about Jungle because I think the the first yes. image was just released right. or I saw it pop yes. up. Can you tell me about working with Daniel Radcliffe on this because he keeps picking really interesting roles, and I mean I assume this is a movie that kind of rides all on his performance. Right. It, it does. It's basically um, it, it, Jungle's a story, a true story about a guy who got lost in the Amazon jungle with two friends in 1981. They hired a guide to go in, on a jungle adventure and things went horribly wrong and only a few of them came out alive. And the main character is based on a guy called Yossi Ginsberg that Daniel plays in the movie. He survived for 20 days by himself in the Amazon jungle. And the story charts his transformation mentally, physically and spiritually as he goes through this incredible um, survival story. Uh, it's really powerful, very emotional and quite scary. And Daniel plays the character and he just does this insane performance it's amazing um he fully transformed for the role and uh, in terms of like as a director he's just a he's a dream to work with because he um he's so professional had so much experience i mean he, he started on blockbusters when he was 10 years old and he was been doing that for for 20 years i mean 10 years so he's just you know this guy who's um totally focused on being you know he's, he's totally engaged with trying to do good acting which for me is like i'm just totally engaged with trying to be a good director so we worked really well together and had a great time working on the movie that's awesome and did you guys shoot on location is that a situation where you got to work with kind of the bare bones and whatever you have there we shot in colombia so basically uh coincident but with no there was no relationship but belco and um and jungle was shot in colombia mm-hmm. back back to back almost and we shot in the jungles of Colombia for, for jungle. And in the second half, we shot in Queensland and Australia, which has a n- nice tropical jungle as well. And lastly, is there a plan for that one? Do you want to do the same type of thing you did with Belco, where you take it on the festival circuit? I think, well, I mean, yeah, we'd love to go to a, to a festival. Um, 
you know, I mean, it's a great way to get a, a captive audience and to have all the distributors there and see a movie. Um, ideally, that'd be the way to go, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that is all the time we have with you, but thank you so much for coming. So hyped about Wolf Creek and everything you are working on right now. Guys, if you are interested in checking out Wolf Creek, the TV show, you can catch it on October 14th on POP, the POP network in the U.S. I believe it's already out elsewhere, so if you do not live in the U.S., you could still watch it anyway. Please check it out. Greg, thank you again for being here. Thank you. You guys can catch Collider Nightmares every Tuesday right here on Collider Video. I am Perry Nemroff. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.